Praise God. Will you turn with me to Revelation chapter 13? We're coming down to the end. I was almost going to close here tonight in this series, our second volume of the battle for the mind. And I was going to close here with a message, um, but I've uh, I'm bringing in something here that I'd rather not preach on. I try to get around it, and it's not the most edifying. It may not be, um, it, it certainly won't be new to most of you if you listen carefully at all. But I, I believe, I feel compelled to do this, and I'm keeping the last message for next week on the mind of Christ as an absolute necessity for us in this very last hour. I am gonna finish this series, and then I've got a very important mini-series on Bible prophecy that I've sat on for a long time and put off for, uh, thinking I'll put it off for a couple of years, but I, I really feel we need to deal with it in just a couple of weeks because of the hour that we live in. I believe it's vital. But here tonight, part nine of this series, and my title simply is Transhumanism. Transhumanism. If you don't know what that is, you sure will shortly. Uh, if you do know all about it, then just bear with me just for a minute of time, a moment of time. You see, we have dealt with this before. I've spoken on it over the past couple of years, but I just want to bring in four great lies that have prepared this generation for absolute destruction. Four ideologies in our world that are converging to bring about transhumanism in the 2020s. And I believe it's to the destruction of our world. But I believe transhumanism for world government, they see it as the beginning. For the evolutionists, they see this as the beginning of a new age. For those in this world who desire financial benefit, they see this as the beginning. But transhumanism, as we read here from Revelation 13, we are going to see that transhumanism is actually the mark for us, the church, to denote the end. In other words, when we see transhumanism come, and I'm going to explain this, as soon as we see it, we go, come Lord Jesus. We look up, we say we're coming to the end. Let's labor for one last hour because it's all over. But the world out there, political, social, military, economic, they all think they are about to embark on their greatest hour. What a shock they are in for. This mark of transhumanism is going to get them happy, but it's going to get us happy as well because we go, this book is true and it's about to close. This is the very last chapter of church history, reading from Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. And it says, concerning the false prophet and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the beast. And the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of the name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and six. Let's pray together. Father, I do pray that you make this so clear that we understand what is happening right now in our world, in the political realm, in the social realm, in the technical realm, nor God in every area of society. Don't let our hearts faint. Don't let us be afraid. But oh God, let us realize that we are about to embark, nor God, on the greatest event in world history, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This 
this mark, this transhumanism, this creation of an image that can speak and that can command, this mark of the beast to buy and sell, it's all an indication to us that it's all over for this world and that the nations of this world are going to become the, the possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship you and we love you tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let me just say before I, I give you this message, a word about what is happening in our world at the minute. All of us for two weeks have watched the news about Afghanistan, America pulling out, and the Taliban moving in. An entire army of 300,000 soldiers fallen to 80,000 Taliban, and an entire nation being taken out of America's hands after 20 years of being there with all of their technology, all of their power, all of their wealth, all of their arms, and yet here this nation has now fallen to terrorists from the mountains. That's literally what has happened. Now, for the first time in a very long while, the media worldwide in the Western world, in Australia, America, and uh, in, within Europe, they're all now saying, speaking out against Biden. Please, I'm telling you something here for a reason of where we're going. Now everyone's saying, for, for a while, the media are speaking a bit of sense. They're saying, what a fool Biden is, what a failure, what a disaster. Do you honestly think that that is an old senile man who's made a foolish mistake in pulling out, not knowing what he's doing? If you think that, you don't know church history, you don't know world history, and you do not know your Bible. You see, I don't think it is an accident. Do you know that the mastermind behind the Taliban's army and the takeover of Cabal was released from an American prison by Obama in the year 2014? Do you know that? He's now leading the way. He's exalting himself. Also, an article in Newsweek just a couple of days ago, Biden handed Afghanistan's mineral wealth to China. It was all about explaining the situation that Afghanistan is the, has the world's largest deposits of lithium, which is gonna be very vital. If you know anything about technology, we are moving in the 2020s to use this commodity more than any generation. In other words, this is gonna be the most sought after commodity of the 2020s. Guess where the world's largest deposit of it is? It's in Afghanistan. It is estimated to be worth between one trillion and three trillion dollars at a beginning. Actually in 2010, there was a briefing given in America to the president and to Vice President Biden that here this lithium was in the nation and that Afghanistan was gonna become the Saudi Arabia through oil. What's, what oil done for Saudi Arabia? This commodity in the ground of Afghanistan is gonna make it one of the richest nations in the world. Do you understand what's happening? Do not believe all that the news presents to you. I actually believe this is a planned, organized, intentional event. It wasn't accidental. Do you know as soon as Biden got into office, he started to pull back those that were gathering information, securing the nation of Afghanistan. He said, stop gathering information within the country. Just a couple of days ago, also all of this high-tech equipment, I mean virtual reality equipment, fell into the hands of the Taliban. They can actually scan your retina and they know, did you work for the American government? Were you for the tal Taliban? Were you involved in any criminal activity? All this information that America, high-tech information, the latest technology has now fallen into the hands of the Taliban. Can you imagine being responsible for that and you leave it behind in that country? All this information that could mean the death of these individuals. 
You know, we live in an hour where one situation like that happens and all of the eyes of the world get distracted. Now the entire world is looking and going, what a fool Biden is. What a disaster for America. What a tragedy in Afghanistan. If you think this was some freak accidental thing that they didn't know what was going to happen and that they don't know what is in that country, you've made a great mistake, I want to assure you. We are living in an hour that if you're not careful, you're going to miss what is happening on a worldwide scale and is prophesied in our Bibles. Here tonight, I want to deal with transhumanism because I believe here in Revelation 13, making an image of a political leader, I mean the foremost political leader who gains power and they have the technology. This is a prophecy 2000 years ago. They have the technology to make an image of that man and that image they have the ability to give it life or the breath of life, or consciousness. And that actual image has the ability that if you don't take the mark to give the command or to bring about your death, can you imagine that? That image that's gonna stand in Jerusalem has the power that if any individual, in other words, it's no king, no general, not the 10 world leaders who command the death. It is no person sin. you die if you don't take the mark. It's not. The command is given by an image of a political leader. I mean an image that can live, it can speak, it can give commands, and it's orchestrating worldwide, it gives the command. If anyone does not join this economical system, this political, this religious system, they must die. Do you realize we are right there, right now? We are approaching this hour where now all the world banks, the central bank, the IMF, the UN, the EU, all of our world governments are now preparing to go onto a digital system and they're talking openly about putting chips in the hand, in the, in the brain and doing, bringing about. This is the very hour. We have never been here before. We have never been here. The world governments are going, this is our hour. We are gonna grab the mind of this generation. We have accomplished something politically. The evolutionists think this is gonna be their greatest hour. But do you realize what's an indicator to them? It indicates something very different to you and I. You see, when I see this come up so clearly, and I go, this is it. The 2020s are gonna be marked by transhumanism. It is sending a message to everyone. But what does it mean to you? Let me give you four ideologies or movements that have gone on over the past hundred years that has prepared this generation for ultimate deception. And we, the church, need to break up and destroy these four lies. Because I believe these four lies are going to be used, these four strategies are going to be used to deceive the world generation that we are living in. The first one is evolution. You see, evolution is the backbone to transhumanism. If you wouldn't have had evolution in the schools over the past 150 years, you could never introduce transhumanism in the 2020s. What is transhumanism? It is joining man, biology, brain to the computer, to the internet. They're about to do it. Do you realize now that in these months, the Canadian government are putting out documents. The British government are. We know the World Economic Forum has promoted this for many years. We realize it's all conversion and this is now the hour. But do you know what their greatest instrument to bring this about is a belief in evolution. Before Hitler could rise in Germany, before he could sell his eugenics, the killing of gypsies, the handicap, the abortion of babies, the destruction of Jews. Before he could introduce this, he needed a generation that was saturated by evolution. Only when a man believes in evolution, that we come from monkeys, apes, animals, that we are nothing else than a bundle of thoughts, 
and biology. When you truly believe that, you have been prepped, deceived, and prepared for transhumanism and the mark of the beast. Do you realize an entire generation that have been deceived by evolution, told that they evolved by their teachers, the universities, the wildlife programs on television, their brain has been saturated with this. And I believe this is the first and greatest lie that has brought this generation to transhumanism. If they'd rejected evolution, they would reject transhumanism. But if you believe evolution, you are going to swallow the lie of transhumanism. You're going to think it is the next stage or step of evolution is going to be transhumanism. You'll remember that it was two and a half years ago, from March to May 2019, that in this church we taught an entire series on evolution, on the myths and links. Every week we dealt with a different missing link that people in this world produce. It was all deception, every single missing link. And we took each one of them and showed in detail why each one of them was a deception. But the last two messages in that series, you may not even remember, two and a half years ago, the last two messages I taught was the next step of evolution part seven and part eight. And do you know what it was? It was this transhumanism. You see, two and a half years ago, that would mean nothing to you. It's a far-fetched idea. It's something I've read in a book. It's something that nobody's really sure about. And you hope it's gonna be 30 or 50 years down the road. But I actually taught you two and a half years ago, this is the next step of evolution. This is where they are gonna take it. And so we see that evolution because it has saturated our society. People are now prepared to join themselves to a computer. That young generation in the city of Limerick, they'll think nothing about taking their mobile chip and saying, oh great, we'll implant it. It will be a part of us. It will be within our body. They're being totally prepared within the next five years to accept this ideology. Saints, I hope you realize that transhumanism is a wake up call to the church. We ought to be saying, come Lord Jesus. We ought to be preparing ourselves in holiness. If ever there's a time for you to wake up, trim your lamp, Make sure your fire is burning. It is actually now. You you don't have years or decades to play with. We as a church must do now what we are going to do. And you know what? We need to tell this generation, you're created in the image of God. When you get born again, you come back into God's plan. He, through a new birth, a new creature is created. And you come smack into the center of God's will for you. It says in Proverbs 23 and 7, as we have dealt with clearly in this series, concerning a man, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you make a man think, now think about this, evolution. If you find someone who really believes this, they believe we evolved. They believe the textbooks of evolution. They actually believe in the Big Bang. They believe we're all accidents. Do you realize as a man thinketh, so is he? Don't tell me that doesn't affect. We have so much come forth in our world because people say we're nothing more than animals. You are an awful lot more than an animal, I assure you. You are a created being in the image of God to commune with God and to live your life for him. When you realize that you're created by God supernaturally, 6,000 years ago, God created one man, one woman. You say, you still believe that? Yes. And guess what? All the experts and scientists of DNA, they only discovered since the year 2000. Whenever they learned the art of DNA, they said, guess what? We all in the world, Asian, African, even Irish, guess what? We all go back to one man. And they, we all go back to the same woman. Isn't that shocking that it's taken all of the, this time 
for these evolutionists. But they said, no, no, don't get any wrong ideas like the Bible is true or those Christians over there have it right. We don't want you to think that. You see, the Adam and Eve that we're talking about probably lived on two different continents. Now, if you want to believe that, you feel free. And they said probably in two different generations. Even though we all come, doesn't matter the color, doesn't matter the language, doesn't matter the culture, we all come from the same man or woman. All of us, as the Bible said, we don't want you to believe that Bible. No, no at all. It doesn't matter that we said we evolved from apes. We don't want you to believe that. Let me just remind you of some of the lies of evolution. In 1859, Charles Darwin wrote his Origin of Species. It was the search for the missing link. And Darwin stated before he died, he said, we are still searching for the evidence. In other words, he built his whole ideology without any evidence. He said, one day they're going to find the evidence. One day they'll find it and my theory will be proved true. Well, 12 years later, he published another book in 1871 called The Descent of Man, where he laid out his theories very clearly and said, we descended from apes and monkeys. Do you realize that teaching? There's no evidence. There's no missing link, not even one. There is no scientific proof. There's no physical proof. But do you know what? All of that teaching from 1871 went into the school textbooks beginning in 1888 through to 1890. All this teaching was introduced before the year 1900. No evidence, no missing links, no physical uh, facts to point to. And yet there it was. He had a very good friend called Thomas Huxley, who also wrote a book in 1863, which is called Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's Bulldog. You know why? Because when he got a hold of a bone, he was like a dog. And you don't want to take a, a bone off a dog, I want to show you. Do you realize? Darwin never wanted to write about this, never wanted to publish his books, never wanted to go public. He was a tormented man in his mind. He was an absolute wreck. But do you know what? It was Thomas Huxley who pressed him and pressed him and forced him and said, you must go to print. We have to speak out against the church in England. And so he forced Darwin. That's why he's called Darwin's Bulldog. He got a hold of him and he compelled him and he forced him. Well, when Huxley and when Darwin died, there's no evidence, absolutely no evidence. But there's a man who read Darwin and who swallowed the deception. His name was Ernst Heckels, and he read Darwin in 1862. Later, as a theologian or as a, a philosopher and a professor in Germany's universities, he drew up a diagram. He made a great discovery, the first great discovery of evolution, and he realized that animal embryos in the womb are exactly the same as human. And he drew a diagram, a picture and laid it out. There's some even in textbooks in Ireland still today of this very picture. Well, he drew the picture, but he never told anyone. He lied. He made it all up. He deceived them. This fraud was put out in 1876 and it, it was used as the main link for the next 30 to 40 years. No evidence. It was years before it was exposed as a hoax. He was found out as a liar and a deceiver, but it went into the universities, into the schools, and it affected an entire young generation who began to see, deceive that. It was built upon a lie. Then there was Java Man that was discovered in 1892 by Eugene Dubois. I believe of France or Belgium. He, f he was down in Java and guess what? He found an ape's tooth, the skull of a gibbon, which is a small monkey, and the leg bone of a human. And wonder of wonders, when he put this all together, he had the missing link. He became very famous. 
uh, through this very popular and was asked for many articles during that time. But do you know what? He never showed the evidence to anyone. He hid it in a box under his bed. All the Santas came. There was a few that initially saw it. And when the questioner said, are you sure? He hid it and didn't let anyone see it. For the next 20 to 30 years, it remained under his bed until it got exposed. Uh, eventually. You know what Java Man was? The skull is no different than an Eskimo's. And of course it was someone building something that shouldn't have fitted together. But you know what? It went in school textbooks. It was spread by very intellectual people and everybody swallowed it. Again, it deceived a generation until it was exposed. Then there was the Piltdown Man, discovered by Charles Dawson. I shouldn't say discovered, I need to start saying invented. This was in 1912 in Sussex in England. What did he find? A human skull cap, the lower jaw of an orangutan, and it took 41 years to be exposed. Only in 1953, it was called the biggest hoax of evolution. But you know what? It didn't get front headlines. Nobody in this generation even remembers or talks about it. These are the biggest lies in world history. They laugh at the church and say, you believe in Adam and Eve? You believe we're all sinners? You believe there's a heaven and hell? And they laugh. And yet their entire thinking, their academia, their science is built on deception. Their greatest spokesmen, their greatest missing links are a deception. It is utterly disgusting. Then there's the Neanderthal. Remember, I think most of you grew up hearing that Neanderthal, they couldn't speak, they were bent, they grunted, they, they were different than us. They're an ape man. Do you know it's only in the past 10 years that all of that has been turned on its head? With the Neanderthal in 1913, Marcellian Buell, uh, discovered in the French valleys, the Neanderthal. What he didn't tell anyone was it was affected by arthritis, but he discovered it and it was only exposed 44 years later in 1957 that it was the effects of arthritis. That's why he painted it with a bent back and with fur all over it. You know what this was? This was deception, brainwashing, and game plan. What about Nebraska man in 1922 discovered by Harold Cook? It was a single tooth in the USA and he rushed to the museums. They said, this is definitely six million years old. Well, it was a, a short time later, five years later, I believe, that they found out it was a pig's tooth, not a human tooth. I can take you through Missing link after missing link. Then there's P. Kingman from 1923 to 27. Pierre Teilhard Teold, de Chardin, a Jesuit priest, said he discovered P. Kingman. But he had an awful lot of other ideology. He is one of the great founders of transhumanism. Before he died, he rode on it, promoted it in the religious world. He said, we are going to join together with one brain. There is going to be the cosmic Christ. We are going to be unified by technology. This man that found Peking man had an agenda. He was also financed by Rockefeller. All the finance went in. You've got to find the missing link. We'll give you as much money, but you need to go and find it. Well, he certainly did. He, w he went to Peking and he found lots of small broken pieces and kept digging, kept giving money until eventually they found Peking man. But what he didn't tell anybody at the time was once they found the jaw, they dug another 80 feet to find other bits to join together to create their missing link. But guess what? 1941, all the evidence disappeared again. All they had was molds, pictures they'd drawn up, but no physical evidence. I can keep going on like this. The tongue child, Lucy, Remember Lucy some years ago, the Rhodesian man, even Dino, Homo 
gorgeous, whatever, however you said, and the famous hobbit that was only three feet tall, but had to be the missing link to show that we descended from apes. Do you realize they've, they, that the two richest men in the world at the beginning of the 20th century, Carnegie and Rockefeller, they were saturated by Darwin's ideology of evolution. And they poured out their great finance into universities, into academia, into media to promote the idea and said, you've got to find the missing link. Well, they're still looking for it. But look at the consequence. This eugenics about men coming from animals and beginning to play with the DNA of men. Guess who picked it up? Hitler in Germany. He raised up a whole generation of chemists, biologists, scientists who had, were indoctrinated by evolution and they began to destroy an entire generation. Also, Stalin in Russia took this on. And in China, the communist government, they also were affected by this. Now what is the result in our generation? An entire generation aborting their babies. Now we've got a generation that are being taught in our schools, being brainwashed at a young age, that you could be a boy, a girl, or something else if you so desire. And you can change your mind next week. We have a generation where transgender is promoted, while those who are normal and clear thinking and saying are being persecuted and now the last bit of the jigsaw to go in is euthanasia do you realize this ideology the fruit of evolution has destroyed the mind of a generation and this is our message tonight transhumanism is an attack on the mind evolution has destroyed the thinking what you think you are if you imbibe evolution this makes you into something. You'll accept a lot of things. But if you believe you're created in the image of God, that there's a heaven, a hell, a God in heaven, it affects your life. Let me go to the second one. Evolution is the backbone to transhumanism. It's vital. Take away evolution. You don't have transhumanism. It destroys it. But do you realize all the men who believe in transhumanism began with evolution? Second of all, pharmakia or pharmacia, depending on how you want to say it. You see, evolution destroyed a generation in their education. Pharmacia is destroying us mentally, medically. It's using the medical profession to destroy a generation. Listen to what it says in Revelation again about this same system that's going to have a mark of the beast, that's going to have an image, that's going to have world power. It says in Revelation 18, 23, about when God judges Babylon, the capital, the city, the mega city, I believe it's going to be a, um, an intelligent city that arises. Babylon's going to be the center of world wealth. Listen to what it says in Revelation 18 and 23. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. This is when Jesus comes back to destroy Babylon. He's going to destroy that city. It's an entire civilization, a new culture with transhumanism dominating it. But notice what it says. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Babylon the great at her destruction, at her end. God is going to accuse her. You deceived all nations through your sorcery. What does the word sorcery here mean in the Greek? It is the Greek word pharmacia. It's where we get our word pharmacy or pharmaceutical. This is the actual word. And this is one of the reasons God destroys Babylon. And in fact, it shows this is how Babylon managed to deceive every nation, an entire generation, and draw them into this. How did they ever manage to deceive them? Yes, by supernatural signs and wonders, but also by pharmacia. You see, I believe that pharmacia is connected to transhumanism. 
It's going to be a vital part of deceiving people to make them to accept transhumanism. It's going to be connected to it. It's going to be the means of blinding your eyes, of shutting your ears, of closing your mind. And once you're in that state, they're going to mark you with this world system. The word pharmacy is used five times in the New Testament. Once in Galatians, it's a sin of the flesh. So it's not just a thing, but it's an action. It's a way of operating. But also four times in the book of Revelation. Listen to what it means. It means the use of medicine, drugs, either for spells, for sorcery, for witchcraft, or for drug-related sorcery. Plato, some uh, two and a half thousand years ago, listen to how he defined this Greek word pharmacia. He said it is a medical drug or a magical potion or a poison. Most often when he talks about it, he said it's a herb or a created manufactured drug. And it was used in the city of Athens in Greek. And if someone died through you administering this drug medically for their benefit, saying this is going to help you, if you use a drug and they die, you deserve the death penalty. In fact, he said you're to be considered a murderer. If you're a doctor or someone in a position of influence and you use pharmacia and someone suffers, you ought to die. Plato said it is so serious, you're a murderer. Because you know what? You're using something. It's like using a knife. It's like using a gun. It's like using a sword. You have killed that person and you have used something to do it. Notice here in Revelation 18, it said all the nations are going to be deceived through pharmacia, or we could say pharmaceuticals. I believe in this last hour, the 2020s, the pharmaceuticals, this use of pharmacia is going to be so used to deceive nations. I mean entire nations to bring them into the system of the one world government. Notice what it says about them. It says, thy merchants were the great men of the earth. That is who spread the pharmacia or used sorcery to deceive the nation. Who was it? Was it, was it the doctors? Oh no, it was the merchants who done it. Merchants means those who buy and sell or the traders. In fact, it said, your traders, your businessmen, are the greatest men in the world. Not just great men, they are the very greatest. They are the most known, they are the richest, the most powerful, the most influential. It is these tradesmen of Babylon, of this last world government, who are gonna use pharmacia to deceive an entire generation. You may say, that's crazy to think. How, how do you ever think this is gonna work? Well. There was a book written at the end of 2019, published in the United Kingdom in Europe, in English, in about September or October of 2020. What a time for it to be published. Let me tell you what it's called. It's called The Poisoner in Chief. That's the title of the book, right in the midst of this COVID crisis. This historian, who previously had investigated the CIA and released documents inside internal documents to show that from 1947, when the CIA was created, from Hawaii all the way through to the Iraqi war, that the CIA were involved in 14 political coups to bring down national governments, and yet they denied it, they lied about it. In other words, they started these four, 14 coups, and he records it with evidence, factual evidence. Do you know another insider in the CIA, a top CIA uh, overseer, he actually estimated they, it, it was in fact a lot more. It was well over 100 countries they intervened in to change the direction of their governments. Let me tell you something else that I can prove with factual information. Do you know it was the CIA who financed the creation 
of the EEC. You know it as the EU, the European Union. They provided all the money. I've researched this. I've looked at the evidence. This is known factual evidence. But you know what? Historians, scholars, those who researched knew this is true. But the average person doesn't. It's not in your news or your school education or on your television, so you don't know this. The CIA financed the creation of Europe. And when Churchill started to say, we're standing for the sovereignty of a nation, you know what? They said, get rid of that man. And they brought in the founder of Bilderbergers to take his place. What a good man to take Churchill's place. You know, people in this hour, they actually say, Conspiracy theories. If you accuse what's going on over the past year and a half, they say that's a conspiracy theory. If you can get caught up in that, you don't know history. Because you know what, if only you knew what's happened over the past 150 years, you would tremble at what governments have done that you don't know about. Let me give you an example about Czechoslovakia. It's now the Czech Republic and Slovakia and wherever else. But in 19... And 38, Slovakia, uh, sorry, Czechoslovakia was the most industrial country in Europe. It was the richest country. It had the best army. It, it had the best government, the best leader in the entire world. It was prosperous, strong and dominant. It was the only nation in Europe that could meet and defeat Churchill. But do you know what happened? They got defeated without firing a shot hardly. The Germans drove in. How did it happen? It was the British Prime Minister Chamberlain and all of his staff and the British government. I, again, I'm reading the documents. He begins his propaganda against Czechoslovakia. He said, Hitler has to rise to power. Listen to me. This is Chamberlain who come back with his bit of white paper said, peace in our time. A man of peace, he was nothing of the sort. He was a man of power who was a liar and a deceiver. You know what he was doing before coming back with peace in our time? He was a man of peace presenting himself. In behind the scenes, he's threatening the Prime Minister of Czechoslovakia. He says, you better give Hitler what he wants. If Hitler attacks you, we'll not defend you. We're going to tell France not to defend you. And they said, you're going to get defeated. He started a propaganda war. You don't stand a chance. Hitler's too strong. You'll be defeated. All of it was lies. And he wore the Czech government down because he wanted Hitler to rise. That's Chamberlain who then retired when Hitler got out of hand. You know what? He handed over to Per Churchill and said, get on with it. You, you, you can deal with all of the problems. Listen, the poisoner in chief, I'm talking about this second point, pharmacia. The book was called Poisoner in Chief, written by Stephen Kinzer. Listen to the subtitle. The CIA's search for mind control. You know what he started to investigate at the end of the Second World War? The CIA began to move in. They took control of the Nazi chemists who were eugenists, who used to torture people and kill people en masse, who were engineering the mind and the thinking of the entire German nation to follow Hitler. All these chemists, they come into the CIA. In this book, he begins to share about this, how that a man called Sidney took over a vital position and his job was pills, powders and poison. He was a man commissioned by the CIA all through uh, the 50s to 1973 to gain the power to control an entire population by using pharmacia and mind control and brainwashing. This man in the CIA set about to do this. Listen to what he done. He purchased, when LSD was created in 1943, right after the war, this man, Sidney, bought up all of the LSD in Europe in a lab made by a scientist. It was their safe. He bought it took it back to America and began to experiment on the population. He actually used it on the American population and he is now called the godfather 
in hiding of the 1960s counterculture. The Beatles started to use LSD all as a result of this. All the great magician, musicians, all the great gifted artists, all the great politicians, even those that began to, um, to raise up technology, all used LSD. An entire generation of youth in America were made high on drugs as an experiment by the CIA. Since all of this has been unearthed now, recorded very closely, Another thing that happened in the 1990s, this isn't going back to the 50s alone. In the 1990s, the CIA was discovered to have allowed drugs to flood LA in America. They knew about it, they helped it, they promoted it. Why did they do that? To raise money to supply the anti-communist guerrillas in, Nick in, in South America. All of this was under the hand of men. You know what I'm telling you is that this is the second great thing. Evolution is the backbone of this. But also pharmacia has been used and practiced for decades. It flowed out of Nazi Germany as a result of evolution. It come right into the CIA. The CIA have been involved in steering governments all around the world. And I know there's many good people in there and there's much good done, but there are sinister elements that I want to tell you about. How is pharmacia now affecting our world? Let me tell you about one of the great men, just one of them, there are many, but just one of them who's a businessman who buys, sells, makes money. The Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation made a major change in, Mar notice the date, March 13, 2020. On March 13, Bill Gates removed himself from the board of Microsoft. He closed that door and he moved over to the realm of helping the world through vaccine development and, listen to the title, surveillance. On his own website, under this title of vaccine development and surveillance, he goes our goal to advance public goods for global health through technological innovation by accelerating the development and the commercialization of novel vaccines. Here's one of the great men in our world, one of the richest in the world, notoriously the richest man for many decades. I think he's just been beat by Amazon or someone else. All these guys are making a wealth. But you know what he knew? Now is the hour to move to vaccines. I'll make more money from vaccines than Microsoft, computer, or internet. This is the realm. He's a businessman. You know, for the past year and a half, they're not asking the local doctors or educated men. They're asking uh, this man, Bill Gates, what do you think? How should we be operating? I loved an interview just several months ago. They said, so have you had the jab yet? He said, oh no, there's no rush, no rush. Very telling when a man like that said, there's no rush. Why is there no rush, I wonder? Here's a man that's trying to vaccinate entire nations. Here's a man that is absolutely influencing our world with his wealth. And yet here he is moving to vaccination. This is where the money is in this hour. You know, on that day when Jesus Christ returns again, he'll judge the great men of the earth for using pharmacia, pharmaceuticals to deceive the nations. I don't think we've seen anything yet. I'm warning you where this is going. Evolution leads you to this and it begins to lead. You see, you'll start to think you can't survive without vaccines. You need one, you need two, you need the booster. Every year you're gonna need a vaccine to survive. Do you think God's creation is so bad? I want to tell you as the church, we need to go back to divine healing again. We need to rediscover Jesus Christ as the great healer. Third of all is technology. Let me be brief here. I've dealt with this so many times. Technology in this hour. Do you realize I got my first phone in the year 2000? It was a big brick of a thing. You couldn't put it in your pocket. You certainly didn't put it in the inside of your coat jacket. It was a big brick of a thing and a guy bought it for me. He was all happy saying, 
brother, I bought you a gift. I opened it. It was very hard to be happy. When he went away, I said to my teammates, why in all the world would he buy me something like that? Why, why if I'm on a hill praying, would I want someone phoning me? I don't know anyone else with a mobile phone to phone anyway. They can phone me in the house if they want to get in touch. You can laugh at that now. But you know what, then I was utterly disgusted with it. It was an intrusion, an invasion, an encumbrance. This big brick that I think you had to charge it all night just to last for an hour or something. It was useless. I can remember in that same year, 2000, experiencing the internet for the first time. I wasn't really interested in it, never been on a computer, never done anything like that, but someone introduced me. One year later in uh, 2001, I set up my first website and began to preach the gospel and use it. It is the Roman road. I do use technology. I'll use all of this to reach souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. Technology is not wrong. But it is an instrument that's going to be used in this hour. I can also remember seeing, experiencing GPS for the very first time in the year 1991. No one had seen it in Sivvy Street. I was in Saudi Arabia and then into Iraq in a tank. And they had a GP, um, uh, GPS device. And it could give you your coordinates 23 and a half hours out of every day. And we drove across the Saudi and Iraqi desert with no lights on our tank. Once we hit a big hole, I thought we'd been hit by a mine. But we were able to navigate. Nobody had seen GPS at that stage, but it was there in that tank. Do you realize technology has exploded? Until I was 29 years old, none of this affected your personal life. No mobiles, no internet, no technology, no inter none of this of laptops or anything like it, until I was 29. Now it's as normal as breathing, as normal as breathing. You know, by the way, when I was in the Gulf War, the armies that gathered, an army of about one million allied forces, the American forces, there were about, listen this carefully, 250,000 soldiers went into the Gulf War and were in the Middle East when I was there. 250,000. Do you know now at least 50, um, at least one third of them, at least, sorry, let me say that again. It was one third, which was 250,000, now have the Gulf Syndrome, which they say points back to all the vaccinations. The British force was about 53,000 men, armed men in the Gulf. 33,000 of them now, over half, claim to have ill effects from all of the vaccines. That's just from the 90s. Those who say there's no danger here, there's a whole history of problems that people don't even think about. You see, I believe the third area, when we look at Revelation 13, is technology. Evolution is the backbone. Pharmacia is going to be used to deceive people. But technology is the means to bring about transhumanism. You couldn't do this a decade ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. It's impossible. And yet in the books I've read, all the great men dreamed of this. H.G. Wells. Huxley, all of them were dreaming of an hour where technology would be created to create the world brain, to join us all together and to put technology in the body. They've talked about this for many generations, but they were not able to do it. But they can in the 2020s. For the first decade, this is the first decade that they're implementing technology. And they're outspoken about They said, we want a chip in your body. We want a chip connected to the internet. And then it's high surveillance. They know everything that you're going to do. DARPA which is a military arm of the American army, started something called LifeLog. Listen to this. There was an outcry against this research, so it stopped. It was cancelled in the year 2004. What was it? It was research to get into your brain. They're after your mind. They want to hack your mind. 
This is the great thing of this hour. It's your mind, your thinking. That's why we're doing an entire series on this. You know why? The fight for your mind has just reached another speed. We are entering something here. It's no longer evolution in textbooks, in the schools. That was dangerous. Now they want to get technology right into your brain. They want to get in there. Well, DARPA stopped this life log in 2004, but it carried on under other names. In 2016, DARPA released limited information that soldiers <coughs> would have chips uploaded to their brain. It's 2016. Do you hear me? They're releasing this information. Where did it begin? With the American army, with DARPA. They worked on this for a long, long time. And they began to say, we're going to have to enhance our soldiers. In 2013, just three years before that, President uh, Barack Obama announced a joint initiative between the United States and the EU, the European Union. What did they call it? The Brain Initiative. It means brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies. And he granted an initial estimated 300 million. He said, get that brain chip. We need that brain chip. Europe and America have been working together to create a brain chip to go in your brain, connected to the internet. They're pouring billions in. All the rich men of the world are pouring their wealth into this. This is the research. This is the great thing they're after. They're after the mind of an entire generation. In his speech, Obama revealed that he understood what this was about. He said it would cure physical disorders like Parkinson's. But he went further. He said the real goal of this is to create brain 2.0, where all of us can be connected to the internet. Obama knew where he was going. There are currently, at this time, seven different regional brain projects in the world. They have now all joined up together in a global collaboration to have a brain chip. Wealth has been poured into this. It didn't happen in the previous generation. It's happening now in 2020. I'm telling you, this is transhumanism. It is joining us to the internet. You know, when I preached these messages two and a half years ago on evolution, on all the missing links, the last two messages could have sound crazy. No chance, no hope, maybe one day, but not on our day. Do you know now the British government, the British military, the German government, the Swedish, the Finnish, the Canadian, and many others are making this their priority. Not for the military, not from some unique group. They want every person to have access to this. Do you realize how close we are to Revelation chapter 13? But let me close on just one point here, world government. We see that these four things, evolution, pharmaceuticals, third of all technology, last of all world government, all of these things are coming to a convergence right now in our day. When I see this, I get excited because I go, the day and the reign of man is coming to the end. The, the rule of the Gentile nations is coming to an end. We are fast reaching the end. And you know what? Come, King Jesus. Jesus is going to come. We are not going to usher the kingdom in. This world is going to get more and more wicked, more and more deceived, more and more vile. But you know what? This isn't my earth. We're looking to save men out, bring them to Christ, reach them with the gospel, tell them they need to be born again and washed in the blood. But you know what? I'm looking for Jesus to come. And when he comes, he's going to bring all of this to an end. We're very, very close saints of God. I'm not talking about a generation. I'm not talking about 2050. We are right on the verge of all this. Fourth and lastly, world government. Do you remember in Genesis 11 when they're building the Tower of Babel under the government of Nimrod, that vile man? Listen to what it said in verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. 
The word imagine means to use your intellect, your brain, your mind, to use it to imagine, to create, to plan, to purpose, to begin to lay out plans. That's what it means that there they are at Babel. They're unified. They're doing this together. And you know what? God knew that nothing will be restrained to them. And so he came down and he confounded there their language that they may not understand one another's uh, speech. This was the beginning of world government at Babylon in Iraq Mm -hmm. in that ancient of days. But it's going to happen again at the end. Babylon is going to be rebuilt as a mega city, probably overnight in a very short time with all the technology Uh, that is going on. We're going to see Babylon rebuilt. It'll become the center of economy, of commerce, of trade. It is going to become a phenomenal uh, intellectual and intelligent city. And I assure you, this idea of world government that has been passed down for 150 years, let me finish with this. This ideology of a one world government to do away with nation states. Do you realize who have promoted this very strongly? Evolutionists. Evolutionists. Those that had an agenda to teach evolution widely have very often been globalists seeking for a one world government. Remember Thomas Huxley, who has said was Darwin's bulldog, who pressed him, pushed him to write his books. And remember his good friend, Teilhard de Chardin. These two men who promoted this. Do you realize who Thomas Huxley's grandson was? His grandson was Julian Huxley, the first director general of UNICEFCO, or the United Nations wing, working inside it on education, science, medical, All of these different things he was working on. He was the first director general. Do you know as well in the 1950s, he's the man who created the word transhumanism. It wasn't created in the 1990s. A lot of, you go on Wikipedia, they'll point you there. Or other people will say, it's the 1990s. No, it wasn't. It was this man, Julian Huxley, that was saturated with the ideology of evolution. And you know, his family were globalists. They believed in a one world government. They believed technology was gonna be created that was going to be joined with humanity and was going to affect us. Well, Julian Huxley, he believed in world peace, world security and unity and transhumanism was gonna bring in a one world government. His manifesto for UNICEFCO was called World Evolutionary Humanism. That's what he sold to them. He taught eugenics, birth control, abortion, euthanasia, and homosexuality. Does it sound familiar? He was right on the inside of the United Nations at the beginning. And he made sure these were dominating things that were going to affect every single nation. When he began to write about transhumanism in 1957, he wanted this to go worldwide. It was to be the next stage of evolution, designer evolution. One of the men affected by him is Klaus Schwab, the leader of the World Economic Forum, who is also a transhumanist. And do you know who his brother was? Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World in 1932. Do you know it's a futuristic novel set in London about a world state dictatorship, a world government split into 10 regions, Europe being one of them, a united Europe. In that book that he writes about this tyrannical government arising, in there he writes about cloning, mind control through use and drugs called Soma that they feed out to keep everyone happy. They pay people rather than them working. They entertain them with a sexual immorality. This is all in his book. And you know what? And he said it's coming very, very soon. In 1958, he actually released Brave New World Revisited. 
Listen to what his brother, the one in the UN, listen to what he said as I close here. Transhumanism by Julian Huxley. Here's a quote from it. This is the original document on transhumanism. It is as if man had been suddenly appointed managing director of the biggest business of all, the business of evolution. He can't refuse the job. He must determine the future direction of evolution on the earth. I believe in transhumanism. Once there are enough people who can truly say that the human species will be on this, uh, can, enough can say, I believe in transhumanism. There, we will be on the threshold of a new kind of existence as different from ours as ours is from the Peking man. I'm not surprised you're saying that you've paid for it. It will be at last be consciously fulfilling its real identity. Do you re realize the Bible always talks about the nation state from Japheth? 14 nations came forth. From Ham, 30 nations came forth. From Shem, 26 nations came forth. All through the Bible, it talks about nations. When you get to the end of Revelation, it talks about nations. Do you realize we're going to be part of the Irish nation in the kingdom to come? God is not going to do away with language or color or creed or nationality. Nationality is a God created thing. You ought to enjoy your nationality, the diversity of nations. God has created color, language, culture, nations. In fact, in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 32, Acts 17, and again, Revelation 7, it shows that God divided the bounds. He created the nations. He separated them according to their language and their families. He put them in certain nations. God's plan is for the nation state. And you know what? A world government is against God's plan. At the very point, let me finish. At the very point, Revelation 13, evolution has reached its final stage. World government has reached its final stage. Eugenics are not going to be in the millennium, I want to tell you. Eugenics have reached the final stage. All of this is now set in place. But you know what? For the real believer in Christ, when he sees all of this, he doesn't get scared by God's grace. He doesn't throw in the towel or despond. You know what? We are in a very dark hour. But it's the last hour to rescue souls and saying you must be born again. There's a creator who loves you. There's a Jesus who died for you. There's an eternal life that's way beyond this. What they have searched for, you know what they teach in transhumanism? We're going to cure all illness. We're going to find the key to eternal life. We're going to make you that you can live forever. They're not going to do it. But I want to tell you in this book, it tells you how to live forever. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never perish, never go to hell. You'll abide. All those who do the will of God will abide. But all those who follow this deception, Candace is going to come. And as we close, she's uh, just got a song here. I believe a real song of prophecy that the Lord gave her some years ago. And I believe it's for the hour that we live in. Praise God. Oh 
shall come Who are not mine The gospel preached In every corner of the earth Do you not know The season or the time Take heed Lest you sleep or your oil run dry What must I do Precious Lord What can we do In this hour Have I not said Watch and pray Take heed, wake up, and keep the vows that you made. Watch, for you know not the hour nor the day, for the time of sorrows is here. Have I not said you'd be brought before men, men of rank and men of power and of might? And have I not said take no thought for what you'll say, for your lips with the holy coal? I'll burn Heaven and earth Shall all pass away But my word Shall always prevail Shall I not say Watch and pray Take heed wake up and keep the vows that you made watch for you know not the hour nor the day for the time of sorrows is here